please welcome Kathleen Spence. The President of the United Federation of Teachers, Michael Mulgrew. <laughs> Assembly Member, Neely Rosick. <laughs> State Senator, Andrew Gernardis. <laughs> Please welcome the New York State Attorney General, Letitia James. And please join me in welcoming the 57th governor of the great state of New York, Governor Kathy Hochul. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the United Federation of Teachers. My name is Michael Mulgrew, and I'm the president. And if you see some of us wearing pink today, uh, it's because today is our, uh, what we call a citywide meeting, and we all come in pink in honor of uh, big supporters of breast cancer awareness. But today we're here to do a couple of really good things on uh, things that are long overdue, long overdue. I remember having a conversation with our attorney general a year, uh, about a year ago, about nine months ago, we had this conversation. I remember talking to the governor about it, and I'm so happy today that we have both Senator Gennardis and Senator, you know, Nelly Rosick, because this is a tough thing we're doing, but it is so important. The last time, first and only time, that the United States government passed a bill to protect children in social media was 1998. There's never been one since. So just think what has happened since 1998. There was no YouTube. There was no Facebook. There was no Twitter, Snapchat. Keep going. They weren't there. They did not exist. And uh, this industry is very good uh, at basically telling everyone you can't tell, you, you can't tell them what to do. They want to do whatever they want to do. And that's the problem. And because there are predatory algorithms out there doing horrible things, and they keep saying uh, we'll take care of it, but they cannot. Because there's just too many actors inside of this, this field that has now become so prevalent in all of our lives. So today we are here to talk about the things we're, we're about to do. And once again, it is New York leading the way. We're not going to be Washington, D.C., who keeps saying we have gridlock. It's not gridlock. It's lobbyists stopping them. And we're going to have to push through this, and that's why it's going to be a fight, but it's one we're going to get done because the children of New York deserve protection when they're on their phones, and that's why we're here. And I want to thank the governor for leading the way. New York out there in front of everyone saying, you know what, we're sick and tired of waiting. We're going to take this issue on ourselves. And that's because you've always been there. If it's tough, I know you. You always say the same thing. Oh, I don't care. If it has to get done, we got to try to get it done. So let's go get it done. And that's why we're so honored to have you here. And we're so proud that you are our governor, Governor Kathy Hochul. Our children are in crisis, and it's up to us to save them. That is what we're here to talk about today. That is why we have incredible leaders who've banded together in pursuit of doing what's right. And leadership matters. Mike Mulgrew, yes, he represents teachers, but I know he represents the children. And I have been on this stage so many times. We've made great announcements to support our teachers, but also to continue investing in education the way the likes of the state have never seen before. Mike, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for your friendship, and thank you for leading this extraordinary organization. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Margaret. And you'll be hearing from Tish James, who is afraid of exactly no one. <laughs> That's what I love about her. That's what I love about her. So proud to have her uh, as the state's attorney, uh, representing all the people with such heart and conviction. This is an issue she has championed a long time. And we're joined together in this because we know there'll be some headwinds. There'll be naysayers. In fact, there'll probably be people running to the courthouse in the next hour. But that's all right. You know what I say? Get in line. 
<laughs> also, the individuals who care so deeply about this issue that they put pen to paper or fingers to pad. Senator Gunaris, Senator Member Neely Rosick, I want to thank both of you for caring enough about our kids to go where no man or woman has gone before in the state of New York. And it is courage at times like this when people know our priorities. So I want to thank both of you for being the champions and sponsors of legislation that will be introduced. Uh, let's give them another round of applause as well. <laughs> Speaking of courage, you're going to hear from Kathleen Spence. Why Kathleen Spence? She's an educator, but she's a mom. And she's going to tell you a story about her beloved daughter who went to the brink and was brought back. I will tell you in her own words, but I know that we want to protect our children's identities and we care about them deeply. But she is out there and her daughter's out there now, uh, so others will not fall prey to the evil forces that lurk on social media. So thank you, Kathleen. Let's give her a round of applause as well. During the pandemic and shortly thereafter, I gathered a group of teenage girls in the Bronx to have a conversation about what life was like. And I wanted them to be very candid in telling their stories. No press in the room, no other adults, just us, just girl to girl. And I still think about that conversation because it haunts me to know that years after the end of the pandemic, the, the wounds are still there. They're deep. These girls, because of the disconnection from the norms, their classes, their teachers, their friends, the ability to go out and just hang out in gathering spaces, they were relegated to the world of the internet, social media, to do their schoolwork, but also that was their connection to friends in the rest of the world. Now, as innocent as that sounds, it was not. They talked about how they're still struggling. These are just random girls selected to have a conversation with the governor, telling me that they're still very anxious about things and they're feeling sadness and depression. It just never seems to go away, what they saw and endured. And things got so tough, some of them admitted they considered taking their own lives. Now process that for a moment. That's an age just be young and carefree. Thinking about, you know, I'm just a kid. I'm going to enjoy life. Got a lot of cool friends. They want to be popular. They want to wear the right clothes. Think about music. Can I get to a concert? And these teenagers, ranging from 13, 14, and 15, put a spotlight in my mind that our kids are desperate for help. And we weathered as adults a public health crisis, but these kids are still experiencing the negative effects on their mental health driven by social media and the algorithms that bombarded them incessantly ultimately created, intended to create an addiction. They talked to me about their isolation, how they felt, but the relief they got was from this constant connection on social media. Now, they didn't ask for a lot of this. Do you understand how an algorithm works? It follows you. It preys on you. You don't ask for this content. It finds its way to you by very sophisticated ways that the social media companies have created to continue bombarding you and penetrating your mind with images and thoughts. Now, there was darkness out there. And I don't think many adults understood how powerful and dangerous these algorithms are. They target our insecurities. And for these girls that lifted them into depression and questioned their own self-worth. And teenagers are vulnerable enough as it is. I've raised a couple. Thank God they're not teenagers anymore. Uh, we've been through that. But it also can take a deadly toll. And that's just not hyperbole. Uh, we've talked about for years the rising anxiety, uh, destructive teenage behavior. And what we did not see at the same time was technologies being developed. At the same time, these little brains are being developed too. Okay, that's what's going on. And a mountain of research today 
prove something that very few parents or teachers, anyone really thought about a few years ago, that social media is causing damage to countless children today. The Surgeon General, now when do you tune in the Surgeon General? They tell you when things are really bad for you. Uh, I remember hearing all about cigarette smoking. You see the sign on the package, you learn about alcohol, and bad for pregnant women. You, they tell you when things are really bad. They don't wake up every day and come up with some announcements. When the Surgeon General speaks, it means something. So for the United States Surgeon General to say that teens who use social media more than three hours a day face double the risk of depression and its symptoms, that's based on clinical study. Now, three hours a day sounds like a lot. The average child in this country spends three and a half hours on social media. That's the average. So what changed? What's changed? The rise of social media, of course, but to know that more than half of teenage girls are, are reporting persistent sadness, depression, likeliness to want to kill themselves. The data around the negative effects of social media on these young minds is irrefutable. And knowing how dangerous these algorithms are, I will not accept that we are powerless to do anything about it. We have an obligation. My responsibility as the governor of New York is to protect our people. It doesn't matter how young they are or what the threat to their well-being could be. Like I said, we prohibit cigarettes and alcohol. Teenagers can't have access to them because it's a threat to their health. I'm telling you, these algorithms are a threat to their health as well. And I mentioned my teenagers. Luckily, they're grown up. But I have to wonder what kind of world is going to be out there for a little grandbaby we call Sophia. This is where my mind goes. Will we have the courage at this point in time, in 2023, to take steps, at least in the state of New York, and stand up for our kids so the world we're passing off 10 years from now, 15 years now, to a, a little granddaughter today is a lot safer than it is right now, that lessons will have been learned. But we took the corrective action. We didn't continue on that path because the status quo is always easier. And my God, who are we to stand up to these social media giants? Well, we are. That's what today's all about. And there's a cost. There's an effort. There has to be mobilization. But just think back when you were a kid. Could you have imagined the thoughts that kids are feeling today. And I want to say you probably didn't. Some, yes, but not the majority. The difference is these influences. And I say, as Mike said, the time for action is now. And shame on all of us if we fail to do something about it. Talking, talking, talking is cheap. Let's do something about it. Now, we can hope and wait for the social media companies to wake up one day and say, ah, this is not good for young people. Despite our profits and corporate interests, you know what, this is bad for kids and we're going to stop. Or we'll find a way to have controls, right? Hoping is not a strategy. We're not gonna sit here one day longer and hope that they get it. It's time to act right now. So let me say this. We have some ideas. I think they're smart, they'll be effective. And through the smart, effective laws and regulation, we can take the first steps to bringing our kids back and, pre and preventing more from falling into the abyss. If we can have some control over these sophisticated algorithms, the legislation today, again, is a testament to what partnership looks like. Our Attorney General, she'll be out front defending this law but ultimately protecting parents and their kids. The teachers, parent organizations, we will need all of you. We need everybody. We can't go this alone because we're changing people's attitudes. And I'll be the one of the first to say there are many, many positive benefits to social media. Of course there are. I'm not here to say there isn't. But no one took the time to study the detrimental effects on our children. We have the results, we have the data, so now it's time to shift. Just like 
the movies of the 1950s, everybody was smoking a cigarette, weren't they? James Dean, everybody was cool. You're all too young. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you saw that. You saw that. It was glamorous, right? And all of a sudden, you realize, you know, maybe kids shouldn't be subjected. Maybe their lungs shouldn't have this. And we stopped. Teenage rates of smoking went down dramatically. I would say they're healthier adults. They're breathing better. And we protected them. That's exactly what we're talking about. The data is clear. And again, I want to talk about the two bills that are being introduced today, and you'll get more detail from the sponsors, who, again, I commend. I tip my hat to them. The Safe for Kids Act will prohibit minors from being exposed to dangerous, addic addictive feeds like the ones that torment our teens. And the Children's Data Privacy Act will guard children from online entities who, sol who, who attempt to collect their personal data. Think about this. Does anybody in this room think it's all right for these companies to collect personal data on your kids? Who's okay with that? Raise your hands. It's just common sense. But in some corporate boardrooms, they, no one thought about that. There must be no parents out there because they didn't think about this. Well, as a result, we're thinking about this. We're going to introduce these bills. And again, sponsors introduce the bills. I sign them. Attorney General enforce them. That's what we have going on here. They'll give more parents tools to give, keep their kids safe, limit social media's outreach, and also loosen the grip that these algorithms have on the way our kids think and act. And for minors, it's going to give them, these kids will have to have parental consent, parental consent for notifications overnight. Now anybody have kids out there? Hear the things going off all night long? They're not getting their rest. They're not, they're not sleeping. Again, I said my kids are older. I've got nieces. I've got teenagers in my family. They look tired the next day because everybody's talking all night long. We can change that. Let's protect our kids and make sure that we do whatever we can. And we'll restrict access to apps. We'll find many, many ways to protect our children. But the details are here. They'll explain them. I'm just here to say, time's up. Time's up. We will protect our children, and I have enormous respect for technology companies that are finding their way to New York. This is, says the door is still wide open. Come to New York, create jobs. We're proud that this is, we have more tech jobs in the metropolitan New York region than anywhere in the country. We want to continue to cement that belief that this is important for our future. We're simply asking the social media subsets within the tech companies, the social media companies, to work with us, join with us, show courage yourselves, because that's a better place to be than against us. Because this is a time when we say, who are you standing with? Our children or your profits? It's an easy one for the people in this room. It's an easy one for the people of New York State. So there's an opportunity to work together, to not challenge, to recognize that things have changed. There's more knowledge and intelligence. And these will have no effect on ability to operate in New York. They'll have no restrictions on the companies themselves to do their other work. But we're focusing on our kids. And I know many of these social media companies will be concerned about this, and I'll say this. Time to develop the guardrails. Time to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And let people know that I will respect First Amendment rights every day of the week. We protect them here. But also, we'll protect our kids. And there's not a conflict. There's no conflict. We're not restricting free speech. No one is being banned from anything. I'm telling you all this now because when the lawsuits show up, I'm going to say, I said we're not going after free speech. But parents, this is the day. This is the day many have been waiting for. And finally, this shows our priorities. This shows that there's adults in the room. Adults in the room, this room and all over the state of New York, who will lead by example. And we accomplish this and are successful. The rest of the country will pay attention and say they got it done in New York. This is the path you will follow because there's children all over this nation 
who need our care and support. It's not just for New York children today. And you'll hear about this again from Kathleen Spence and what their family endured. But I know we can foster a thriving technology environment right here in New York. I will support that, always have, always will, but without negative consequences for our children. That's how you build a safer and healthier New York. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, let me introduce our great Attorney General, Tish James. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be here this afternoon with our great governor, Governor Kathy Hochul. Thank you for your leadership. And of course, State Senator Andrew Gennardis and Assemblywoman Neely Rosick, who just welcomed a new addition to her family. So congratulations, Assemblymember. Yes. And thank you to Michael Mulgrove, and thank you to all of the teachers who are here today. Thank you for all that you do each and every day. I would not be in this position but for teachers who taught me each and every day and who taught me to love uh, books and to love learning and to stand up uh, to bullies. So I thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Michael Mulgrew, for leading the way. And thank you to all the unions and advocates, the experts and stakeholders who are joining us here today. Um, NYSA and CSA, thank you so much. We are gathered here today to announce legislation that will help protect children and young adults from the harms of social media. As you can see from this impressive group of allies and advocates, this is a major issue that we all feel strongly about and that must be addressed. Nationwide, children and teens are struggling with significantly high rates of depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and other mental health issues, largely because of social media. Teenagers and children are spending more time online than ever before. Teenagers are online for at least eight hours a day. And children are spending at least five hours online each and every day. And most of the time, they're on social media. It's not a coincidence that young people are spending more time on social media. Social media platforms manipulate the content children see online to keep them on the platforms as long as possible. They know that the more time children spend online, the more ads they will see, and the more data that can be collected to sell to advertisers. The companies we are focusing on are the ones that rely on algorithm, alg algorithmic feeds to show new content to users, content that people would not otherwise see because they don't follow the original posters. This includes TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, X, formerly known as Twitter, and others, to keep users on their platforms for as long as possible. And these companies promote content that they know arouses strong responses and impulses. For children, this includes some of the most problematic content, and it is taking a toll on their mental health. As was, as was just um, reported uh, by the governor, a report by the Surgeon General shows that youth who spend more than three hours a day on social media are twice as likely to experience depression and anxiety. Young New Yorkers are saying that while social media can be fun and help them stay informed, it can have a negative effect on their mental health. They report things like social comparison and content that focuses on their physical appearances as taking a toll on their mental health. And we know this to be true, especially for young girls. Earlier this year, the CDC released a heartbreaking report showing that teenage girls and LGBTQ plus youth are experiencing record levels of sadness and violence. Because in 2011, the year addictive feeds were introduced to social media, and in 2018, self-poisonings amongst 10 to 12-year-old girls increased by 300%. Hospital admissions for self-harm amongst 10 to 14-year-old girls increased by 200%. 
major depressive episodes amongst 12 to 17-year-old girls increased 52%. Emergency room visits for suicidal ideation and attempts by children and adolescents increased by nearly 100%. And suicide amongst 10 to 14-year-old girls increased by 100%. The more time young people spend on social media, the more they are seeing harmful effects, harmful content, content that affects their mental health. And unfortunately, there are ma many tragic examples of how social media can have deadly consequences for our youth. Last year, a 16-year-old New Yorker on Long Island, Chase Nasca, took his own life after watching hours and hours of, of negative content on social media. Chase's social media pages were filled with violent and disturbing content, including a post suggesting that young people should end their lives by stepping in front of a train. This content was served to Chase using algorithms that were meant to keep him on the platform longer. His search, his search history showed that he was interested in videos about Batman and kitchen hacks and motivational workouts. The noise from the social media platforms become too much to bear. And this is the tragic reality that many children and teenagers and parents are grappling with today. Social media is fueling a national youth mental health crisis. And we can and we must do more to protect our children and young adults. And that is why my team worked very closely <coughs> with Senator Gernardis and Assemblymember Rosick to advance legislation to help keep children safe online. For over a year and a half, we worked on these bills and closely monitored what was happening in other states at, and at the national level. <coughs> we saw how legislation raised major legal and ethical and privacy concerns. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is why we drafted these two bills, to ensure that the concerns and the <coughs> <clears throat> to ensure that these the concerns were taken into account, and most importantly, to, to ensure the constitutionality of our actions. Simply put, these two bills target the most dangerous aspects of social media, and they do so in a way that we believe will stand up to scrutiny and to challenges. And while I will defer to our bill's sponsors to discuss the specifics of our legislation, I do want to note that both bills will authorize the Office of the Attorney General to seek civil penalties up to $5,000 per violation from social media companies. <clears throat> we hope that these common sense measures will help protect our children, protect their mental health, and keep them safe. This is an urgent issue that needs bold solutions and requires action now. And that is why I again want to applaud our governor, Governor Kathy Hochul, Senator Gernardis, and Assemblymember Rosick. I thank all of them for their partnership and for their efforts to protect New Yorkers' mental health. And I also would like to thank Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins and Assembly Member, Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty, who have helped make New York a national leader on progressive issues like this. These bills will protect New York children and will be an example for others to follow. And now I have the honor and distinction of introducing to you and bringing up to the podium Assembly Member Andrew Gennardis. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today uh, in this significant step in protecting our children's safety on the internet. 
I'm State Senator Andrew Gennardis from Brooklyn. Um, it's very fitting that we're here at the UFT headquarters. My mother was a proud UFT member for many, many years. So thank you very much, Michael, for hosting us. Uh, you know, I'm not just the proud Senate sponsor for these two pieces of legislation that we're here to announce today. I'm also a proud father to two small children. I'm standing up here today for a very simple reason. I want to raise my children in a world where big tech does not profit at the expense of their mental health. I'm grateful to have the support of Governor Kathy Hochul and Attorney General Letitia James in our fight to protect the well-being of youth online as we head into the upcoming legislative session. And it is going to be a fight. Children across the world are growing up accustomed to spending significant time online, whether for socializing, learning purposes, or for fun, beginning at increasingly young ages. And the research, as we've already heard, paints a very stark picture. For many teens, social media negatively impacts their body image and their sleep patterns. We've heard it, it bears repeating again, youth spending more than three hours a day on social media are twice as likely to experience depression and anxiety, twice as likely. Earlier this year, the Surgeon General issued an advisory saying that social media is not sufficiently safe for children and adolescents and signaled the urgent need for policy interventions due to the concerning effects on youth mental health. Now just think about this for a minute. The very founders of these social media companies don't allow their own kids to use these technologies. What does that say to us? I think we all know. It's our responsibility to establish strong safeguards that protect the privacy and mental health of young people on the internet, just like we do in many other areas of our society. I'm gonna focus my remarks on the first of these bills, the Stop Addictive Feeds Exploitation for Kids Act, or the SAFE Act for Kids, which provides parents and guardians with the tools they need to restrict the addictive features of social media platforms that so often harm young users. Under this bill, addictive feeds, a relatively new technology that purposely creates personalized algorithms to keep users engaged for longer, which just means more revenue for big tech, to be very clear, will be prohibited to users under the age of 18 without parental consent. No longer will social media companies be allowed to purposefully trap children into endless scrolling the minute they log on. Now, for those of us of a certain age, Think about how Facebook used to be. You followed your friends and a couple of pages you liked, and you kept up with everyone without getting bombarded with posts that you never signed up to follow. The good old days, right? This legislation also turns notifications off overnight for young users between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. As a father of a very young child, we all need our sleep during those hours, teenagers included. Um, but of course, we give parents the option to turn that feature off. And we also allow parents to both limit overall usage on the platforms and to turn social media off completely overnight. These very feasible features will empower young users and parents to make informed decisions about their children's online experiences while holding platforms accountable for their actions. As public officials, we all acknowledge the prevalence of social media platforms like Facebook and YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and Snap and, and uh, Twitter or X or whatever they're calling themselves today. However, unlike other mainstream products like smoking, alcohol, and vehicles, which are subject to rigorous government regulation to protect children, so regulation to protect children, social media currently lacks any such meaningful safeguards. Our children deserve a safer and more secure environment online, free from addictive algorithms and exploitation. Algorithms are the new tobacco, simple as that. And together with the support of our governor and our attorney general, fellow legislators, advocates, we are committed to passing these essential measures into law and will no longer allow the interest of big tech corporations to take precedence over the safety and well-being of our youth. I thank you all for your support in being here today. Today, as Michael said, is just the beginning. We are going to need you in every single step of this fight because it will be a fight. And I'm so proud to be joined in this fight with my colleague from the State Assembly, Assemblywoman Nilly Rosick. Thank you, Nilly.
happened to the backdrop. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Neely Rosick. I'm an assemblywoman from uh, Eastern Queens. Good to see so many friendly faces here. And I want to thank um, our two great leaders, our governor, Kathy Hochul, and uh, our great attorney general, Tish James, for being in lockstep and standing with us as we announce these two bills. Um, you know, and I want to thank Mike Mulgrew and UFT and CSA and NYSED and everyone for being here as well. As Mike mentioned, 1998, the late 90s, 2000, is the last time um, we actually legislated about online privacy. And it was called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPA. Specifically, it aimed to protect the privacy of children under the age of 13. So let's think about that for a moment. Late, nine, late 90s, 2000, Y2K was still a thing, and that was 23 years ago. I was in middle school myself. There were no iPhones. There was no Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. The extent of our social media was either sending chain emails to your friends or spending late nights on LimeWire, downloading music and burning CDs. <laughs> the online world is completely different, and we know that. In today's digital landscape, our children's online experiences have a major impact on their future, and they look wildly different than when I was growing up. That's why it's our responsibility to create a safer digital space for all. We must empower our children to navigate online services without compromising their privacy or their mental health. And so much has already been said about that. But there are two recent studies I want to point to as well. A recent study by Pixelate found that two-thirds of, of the thousand most popular iPhone apps used by children collect and send and sell their personal information out to advertisers, two-thirds. That's a huge number. And then another study found that almost 6,000 popular free children's apps are actually in violation of COPA. So it's really time for us to upgrade our laws. We have to ensure that our youngest can navigate the online world both with confidence, but most importantly, with security. And I know that I'm supposed to talk about one of the bills, but I do want to talk, to talk about addictive feeds for one second. As a new mom, as was mentioned, you know, I spent a lot of time overnight with a newborn, and I myself have been a victim of these addictive feeds. I spent so many hours doom scrolling through what my newborn should eat, what she should look like, what milestones she should be hitting, and that is in the best case scenario. I am a grown woman who is able to navigate and understand the online space that I'm in. I can only imagine what that might be like for 16-year-old me or 16-year-old Chase or whomever. That is a scary world out there. And then on a more personal note, I want to say, you know, we, what we've seen on addictive feeds so far and currently very recently, actually, Jewish parents are being told to remove social media apps completely from their phones because there's no way to actually prevent what their children will see. What's coming out of Israel is a really scary, scary time, and showing children through these feeds unspeakable truths is just not a responsible thing happening on our social media platforms. The power of algorithms is unknown, and so we really need to be cognizant of that. The New York Children Protection Act prioritizes data privacy by ensuring that digital services respect their personal information, minors' personal information. It requires this parental consent to collect and use personal information from minors under the age of 13 and puts stringent requirements in place for third-party operators, ensuring that they can handle personal data responsibly and in line with actual user preferences. This act provides parents and guardians with the necessary tools to safeguard their online personal experience and information. I know that it will be a long and arduous road to get these two bills done in the state legislature, but good things are worth that struggle. 
we have to protect our children from what's going on online. And I'm very confident that with our governor, and with our attorney general, and my partner in this, Senator Gunardis, we will get this done next year. Thank you. And now, a woman who doesn't need much introduction, but who will put a personal face and story to this, Kathleen Spence. Good afternoon. I want to thank Attorney General James for setting up today's event and taking a leadership role to the, and to, together with Senator Gnardis, Assemblymember Rosick, and Governor Hochul on this important issue. My loving husband, Jeff, and I, we're both middle school teachers in Suffolk County. Not only are we teachers, but we're parents as well. And unfortunately, our child was severely harmed by social media. My daughter Alexis started using social media without my husband and I's consent at the age of 11. Not only was she on there without our consent, but she was publicly posting about on her age, both on her bio and in her post, stating, quote, 11 years young. The social media companies did not shut her account down, even though it was a violation of their own policy. Alexis wanted to look up child-oriented material, specifically a child's online game that involves stuffed animals. She's 21 now, so those little Webkin toys years ago. Um, instead, as soon as she signed up for social media, she was targeted. Extreme eating disorder and self-harm material. The social media companies use algorithms to increase engagement, and they don't care if this engagement comes from addicting children to their product and pushing harmful material from eating disorder to suicide content to instructions, instructions on how to self-harm. As long as the kids' eyes are on the screen. We now know through many studies that for young girls, the association between poor mental health and social media use is stronger than the association between poor mental health and binge drinking, sexual assaults, obesity, and even hard drug use. It took years for our daughter to overcome her social media addiction and to finally recover from her eating disorder, her self-harm, and her attempt to take her own life that she developed direct results of thousands and thousands of inappropriate posts and images that she received on social media through the algorithm. My family is beyond grateful that Alexis is alive, doing well, and with us here today, though she is forever changed with her illness and what she experienced while she was using social media. Many families, though, aren't as lucky as we are. The Stop Addictive Feed Exploitation for Children's Act, safe for the kids, is necessary to stop addictive nature on social media platforms so that our kids are not spending hours and hours online consuming harmful content. Because I will tell you, as a teacher, they're up all night long, and then they're coming into school half asleep. And they can't learn like that. No one can learn like that. And the New York Child Data Protective Act is what we need to stop social media companies from collecting data on our young children and then using it in ways that are going to harm them. These bills are common sense solutions to protect children online. And I am here to support this legislation because I don't want even one more family to experience what my daughter and our family had gone through. Thank you. Attorney General James, Senator Gnardis, Assemblymember Rosick, and Governor Hochul for making our children's safety a priority and advancing this very important legislation. Thank you.